Lila and Teeps and Floor and me. Rock it. Hey guys, this is the Ecrime Writer here, and welcome to another Spring and Elemental Countdown. April showers bring May flowers, and water is just another synonymous element to spring. Water has been around since Earth's inception, and because it brings life, nothing living can possibly survive without it. Water on its own is easily vast, manipulative, shapeless, and sometimes chaotic. Capable of bending and being used in various ways, from boiling to freezing, or even making its own weapons. No wonder the Chaos Realm appreciates it so much. Hydrokinetics are capable of doing all of that and then some, whether it be destructive or productive. So, consider this list to be a follow-up to my previous electrokinetics list. Whether being an aquadiver or amphibian, these ten entries can douse the worst fires and soak the deserts. Let's dive into the refreshing repertoire. Alright, I know this choice is kind of basic, but just like the fire drink from Shadowgate in my pyrokinetics list, this was my earliest experience of a Hydromancer, known simply as the Water Elemental from Draken. They may just be a simple wave arm of water, and they're often found within the water area of the island, most notably in Hagkin's Castle. It may seem odd that not only can they exist in water, but also over land. No different than a puddle or something. As any wave, it can cause some damage to your team, especially if you're surrounded in water since they're always drown and quickly lose life points as they sink, making them more of a threat. Although they're not encountered so often, hence being so low. No matter how dull and weak an elemental is, especially those thriving in an environment that can deluge or drown, they can still be considered as a threat. It's best to avoid them than not bothering with them at all. It's been a long time since I talked about Actraiser, and for once I shall take the liberty and highlight its malnourished successor, Actraiser 2. Only one boss stood out to me the most, that being the boss of diligence known as Fatigue. Representing the sin of sloth and counterpart of hard work, both its cloud and rider had rained onto the land producing these effects making the townsfolk lethargic and apathetic towards right and wrong, and even life itself. Heck, when you first step foot into your first destination, you'd notice it's been plagued by acid rain, which is just as counterproductive and deadly. Once the pesky plant mini-boss is out of the picture, 
you encounter fatigue which shouldn't be underestimated. The cloud itself expands and sucks in the master as its main meal, but only for a short while. If he's lucky, then he also has to endure boomerang-like projectiles and lasers. Fatigue can still count as a hydrokinetic since it conjures acid-cursed rain from its cloud, and it could expand holding vapor before the dew point. It's a basic example like the water elemental. It can also be the first boss of Death Heme. It's part of the 13 deadly sinners that Master must face, and it's a very tough starting point. If I were to use a Sonic hero, it'd certainly be my favorite, Tails. He can certainly be essential countering Fatigue's draining nature and volatility there. Yet another early example of a hydrokinetic could be the Bubble Dragon Bub from Bubble Bobble. This was actually encountered earlier than both Fatigue and the Water Elemental, but I consider him as such. He does use bubbles, albeit from his own mouth, and it's definitely the contrary to the usual Dragon's Fire, especially Bowser's. Also, for the record, it does count considering that bubbles are generally made from water molecules. And this was established way before Pokemon was a thing using bubbles as a water-type move. So eat that! Not to mention, bubbles are indeed Bub's signature move, trapping enemies inside them, and then popping them with his spiky spines. He can also jump onto his bubbles, allowing him to bounce and reach higher platforms with ease. And as a human, he also utilizes water creating arches of rainbows, which are created with water vapor in conjunction with light. So that counts here too. Whether using them as platforms or decimating enemies, or even using his own bubble flute. Also, side note, Bub is versatile, as he can also combine bubbles with electricity, shocking his enemies and using opposing elements much like Kirby and Crystal Shards. Even charging up his bubble shots and spreading more power. Even increasing in circumference, trapping multiple enemies at once, before destroying them and ricocheting without popping. Heck, his twin brother, Bob, is just as capable on using concentrated hydrokinesis as well. Aside from the majority of Little Samson, Taito was a genius creating the usual games, not counting Rainbow Islands, and even Puzzle Bobble. Bob and Bob use hydromancing in a unique way that is not often brought up. It may not just be a simple spray of water, but since their abilities had been pre-established before those like Pokemon, Final Fantasy, and even Avatar, they certainly are the pioneers. I was pretty disappointed that Kirby never had any Hydro capabilities until Kirby's Squeak Squad, so I guess Bubble Kirby would have to do. While a Hydromancer ability has appeared late than never, it's still not too shabby. Bubble Kirby allows Kirby to wield a wand which is capable on rapidly firing a plethora of bubbles, while also changing its trajectory. Once he has an enemy churned into a bubble, rather than entrapment, Kirby can actually hold on to its copy ability and use it later.
Unless if it's a Waddle Dee, which is the most basic enemy around. They and other bland baddies contain a star for him. Again, just like Bub and Bob, bubbles are also considered to be concentrated molecules from hydrokinesis. And even just like the bubble dragons, Kirby too can charge up for a large bubble with the bubble ability scroll in hand, capable of growing and releasing in front of him for covering more ground. He is higher on the list since he doesn't function like a paper cup, and Kirby on its own can retain its abilities after being hit if quick enough. Even though his hydrokinetic ability is tardy, it was certainly worth the wait. Out of all the Mavericks in the X series, this one was the most decent choice. I was going to pick Toxic Seahorse, but it wasn't much of a Hydromancer if it primarily uses Acid. Duff McWhalen and its stage were pathetic, and Launch Octopus was cheap like Jet Stingray. So Bubble Crab just barely qualified here. Bubble Crab can just be more of a Watermancer than the other Mavericks, before there were the Abominations X6, 7, and 8. Just like Bub and Kirby, its primary weapon is often Bubbles, but it can also summon miniature crabs at will. Only it protects itself from multiple hits, though its claws tend to slice through it as it leaps to catch X unawares from above. The boss arena isn't too deep in difficulty, nor tied as there's little water hindering you, since it is a common detriment in platformers. However, it can raise the depth for a while as it shoots out its own bubble splash technique, or executing other moves like summoning small versions of his own kind. It may seem versatile, but it can also be weak and predictable, especially when using its weakness of its bitter rival. If it wasn't as cocky and so greedy on gaining wealth and power from Sigma, like the majority of people, then maybe it would have been a better Maverick. Nevertheless, I kind of see it as a tolerable choice amongst all the other Hydrokinetics. At least its stage is so-so, and its move, the Bubble Splash, is crucial later on. Okay, I know this seems to be a controversial choice, but before anyone can harass or spam me, I always found the Water Temple not to be the worst water dungeon in the Zelda Juggernaut. The disgrace would definitely go to Majora's Mask due to always rushing with the 3D time limit, the constant irritating farming for needed items, its route to novices, and of course, it has the aqua version of Hell, the Great Bay Temple! I despise Majora's Mask, and it was the game that shunned me out of the whole series just after Ocarina of Time was encountered. Angry Video Game Nerd gave the atrocity more proper justice than anyone, and I'm with Logan and the Tree's Apprentice for labeling that one dungeon as tolerable. And I disdain fried frog legs as well as Hyrule Warriors, since it's non-canon, and none of the stuff you do matters. Much like how insignificant F-099 is. Thus, I'm considering Morpha to not be nearly as bad. 
Morpheus is another amoeba boss, like the Baronade before it in Link's childhood. It was created by Ganondorf's magic using the Triforce of Power, but it was also made to not only drain Lake Hylia, but spread a curse to the Zora by freezing them and their domain. By manipulating Hyrule's water supply and sucking out its vitality, it produced an endless rainfall where its turf, the Water Temple, dwelled, making it powerful and volatile. For seven years straight, the Zoras and the realm's bodies of water have been in great danger, and only Ruta, with the help of Sheik, escaped its tragic fate. As unbelievable as it sounds. In order to defeat it and restore the merfolk to their living glory, Link must play an awkward game of fishing. Oh sure, it was improved in later titles, but this is what started this trend. Morpha is deadly as it functions like an aqua anaconda, constricting its prey and sometimes drowning it or piercing it through spikes. Morpha was definitely tricky. I'm always dreaded fighting it for those reasons, no different than with the Baronid nor Phantom Ganon. And believe me, Morpha can kill you within a minute. Or perhaps if you're one of those nerds, you can trap the nucleus and swipe it with your sword till it's done. Morpha is impenetrable unless your long shot can pierce through and make the nucleus eject from the body and half at it till it hides in the water. It was so nerve-wracking, in fact, that I think it's capable of wiping out a lot of the water-type Pokémon my OC used. You'd better have a Red Fairy handy if you know it's good for you. With such a formidable and dangerous enemy by utilizing water to shape itself, drain the lake, conjure an endless rainfall, and lower the temperature to make Zora's domain freeze? It's no wonder that Morph is qualified to be on here. It might have been better if some of the battle was fought underwater, too. Its death may be unsatisfying as Baraka's demise in Shallon monks, but... All in all, the next time you see an example that's hated by the majority of a community, and you know by instinct there are worse things out there? Always go with your gut and never buy into the assimilating ink crowd. I can't believe nobody, I mean nobody, ever considered Flood! Nobody! Nobody! Owen is going to gush at me for this. Flood, aka the Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing Device, is one of Mario's awesome key partners of the main series. It's just as essential and versatile as Yoshi. Flood only appeared in Super Mario Sunshine, where Isle Davina was being infested and polluted by Baby Bowser, and his messy shenanigans deceived the retarded Piantas as they framed Mario for it. It is the multi-purpose and ever-shifting jetpack and an appliance invented by the prestigious Professor E. Gad, the man behind Luigi's amazing Poltergust. So you know it's a great deal and sidekick. Unlike many machines, Flood functions with water. It does have character, and there has never been any other invention like it. When Mario collects its various nozzles, Flood starts out by spraying a simple streak of water, which can either be long and idle, or light allowing Mario to move. But soon is capable on dowsing much more, 
including a hover nozzle, which double sprays downward, giving the plumber a lift, the rocket nozzle, which shoots out pressurized steam after powering up, giving Mario a boost of height, only on land and no fall damage, the turbo nozzle, which allows Mario to speed over water and land like a jet ski, and there's the racket nozzle belonging to a Japanese exclusive functioning as a tennis racket made of water. Better than your pathetic time limit water swords, Demix. Despite its competence, Flood does have its limits, as it constantly needs to have its water bottle refilled, and it's snatched away by Water Mario many times. And Lava is like its worst enemy despite also being a liquid. Not gonna lie, Flood may be a nuisance at times, but at least it's as wise as Peppy, and just as useful as his other partner in the Paper Mario series. Even sacrificial later on. I wish Flood with all its valiance, handiwork, and it's the one and only inhabitant of Delfino that doesn't make your blood boil. How I wish it was appreciated a hell of a lot more. There was absolutely no way I can possibly exclude the most dreaded Eidolon next to Bahamut, the ferocious Lord of the Seas, Leviathan. Unlike many of his brethren, this beastly behemoth was not introduced in Final Fantasy III, nor used by summoners, but rather he has made his terrifying debut in its predecessor where the townspeople always became horrified on the creature mercilessly defending his oceans, and is capable of swallowing entire vessels whole. In fact, this was demonstrated as Furion and his team wound up inside his body, where it became its very own dungeon! He would definitely give Monstro some heated competition. Despite the fact it's a tad tamer as summoners can use him, he still maintains his overprotective, atrocious persona. Especially in my favorite installment, where he tore apart a ship heading from Fabul to Baron, and Cecil wound up alone and vulnerable in Mysidia, while Rydia was swallowed whole like a snake, resulted young to have amnesia, severely crippled Edward, and took the orphan to his distant home in the Feymark. Hell, he even betrothed to Asura, and they both were Rydia's own guardians and rulers of the Eidolans. The after years... he wasn't that dependable, as he discarded his adoptive daughter and betrayed her while being brainwashed by the Maynads. In 6, he acts like a random encounter in the world of Ruin instead of attaining the usual magicite, much like Doom or Behemoth. It's actually more suitable once you find him within the Deathly Ifa Tree in 9. And in Spira, all the dirty deeds and likeness go straight to sin. Of course, his signature move is Tsunami, or Deluge sometimes named during battle. It is one of the most fatal hydrokinetic moves capable of wiping out your whole team or enemies in one hit or more. No different than with Cognazzo, the Floodworm, or its own clone, Ogopogo. Oh cool, we got a palindro. It also does massive unblockable and inevitable damage. And it's no different when used in Dissidia, where it gradually decreases the enemy's bravery to increase your own, even when it's gone. Also, bonus points since he uses Cryokinesis as well. So, why does he take the bronze medal? Eh, Leviathan may be great, but it's always this fear factor that holds him back. 
Still though, I would love for him to go fin to fin against Monstro and even Gyarados and have a fight to the death in the Pacific Ocean to prove their worth. That can definitely be the battle of the millennium. Ah yes, Chaos from the Sonic series takes the Silver Trophy. No Hydromancer's list can ever be complete without it as Leviathan. Much like the Lord of the Seas, he is quite the Titan and a famous formidable beast. The aquatic amphibian was known as the guardian of the adorable Petite Chow, but then, since they've been living under Chief Hachakamek's abuse, and only his daughter Tikal was the one who cared and protected them from harm. By the time the terroristic Shibna began to use power of the Chaos Emeralds to wage war, it became an absolute destructive deity. As a result with the powers of the Chaos Emeralds and the Master Emerald, both it and Tikal's spirits were imprisoned for eons. It wasn't until the events of Sonic Adventure when they were both set free, and Chaos as we knew it went on the same decimating spree with its restless spirit. Of course, Dr. Robotnik, the callous bastard that he was, researched the monster from the ancient ruins and stole each of the Chaos Emeralds which enable Chaos to morph up various forms. Its boss fights are a tad on the easy side, but it's far from shallow, much like all the lakes and parts of the city it invades. The Chaos Emeralds also allow it to reassemble itself after being inflicted. It can shrink and move just as a puddle allowing it to go through closed-in spaces like sewers, creating enormous shockwaves, and of course, once all the emeralds are gathered, it becomes a complete kaiju drenching and wrecking all of Station Square. Like a damn Category 5 hurricane or tsunami. In order to... not necessarily kill it, Tikal advises Sonic to use the power of the Chaos Emeralds in conjunction with his pure spirit to actually calm the beast. With enough contact and injury, Chaos's wrathful spirit began to dissipate, reducing it to its basic self and also reunite with its lost docile kind. Despite its madness, they and Tikal were still happy to see their guardian alive and well, rather than being insane and consumed by hate. Before it and Tikal's spirits lifted into the afterlife and rested in peace. Even though it doesn't speak, I can still relate to it. And it's just pathetic how every monster tried to be a complete failed ripoff with it being original. Especially with the Fire Elemental Iblis or even Mephilus. Unlike many hydrokinetics or elementals in general, with so much betrayal and pain it goes through, it still has no words. Then again, action always speaks louder. I don't always relate to the silent protagonist, but in this case... No, no, don't speak. For some moments in life, there are no words. Run along now. Adieu, adieu. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Alright, we plowed through nine torrential contenders on this choppy list. But before we get to the highest, mightiest wave of them all, let's have the honorable and dishonorable mentions break the undertow and the surface.
It's no wonder that Fawful's minion prefers it as his second favorite legendary. Kyogre is the true lord of the oceans and his first place is my all-time favorite hydrokinetic. Ever since it was well-renowned as the mascot of Pokemon Sapphire during the third generation, it's been unstoppable. And just like Chaos, action definitely speaks louder than words here. First off, it's a legendary, and we hardly saw any water-type legendary since Suicune and also Lugia, only portrayed in the second movie. So the Aqua Tank in itself is definitely a treat. There is a plethora of reasons why it's beloved by many, and can drown Ruto in the deepest trenches of the competition. First off, Kyogre is a lot more versatile, as not only is it capable on flooding the entire world with torrential rainfall and towering tidal waves, but it has its ability Drizzle which increases its astronomical stats, douses all fire, rock, and ground types, and even makes all electric moves accurate. Heck, Kyogre doesn't utilize just Hydrokinesis, despite being a mono water type, as like Leviathan, it wields frigid moves, electricity, and even is capable on calming its mind to increase its prowess and shift the ground beneath it. That's what causes tsunamis, after all. Not to mention, Kyogre is more than capable in battle, as a one-man army with extraordinary special attack and defense, and being known as one of the very best special walls in the entire Juggernaut. One trip can cause a damn deluge, much like Viathan and Chaos. Speaking of the former, Kyogre's origin is heavily based on the mythological atrocity, while also having traits of Neptune's fellow cetaceans such as whales and dolphins. Kyogre has become as nefarious as covering the world with water, even more powerful than Noah's Ark, is a devastating rival to Groudon, and a main part of the Weather Trio, that even its own markings are displayed on Wes's snag machine, Sir Aaron's gloves, and Spencer's staff. No wonder its pectoral markings glow and their markings connected to the seas themselves. It may not traverse on land like an amphibian, but it can sure as hell make up for it in spades with all its delusion capabilities in a matter of seconds. It's no question why Team Aqua prefers the representative of the Aquamancer Spectrum. Unlike Oscar or many others who'd rather prefer fried frog legs, Kyogre, with its famous reputation, various capabilities, unfathomable offense and defense, and skyrocketing stats, whether it's primal or basic forms, all make it the most prominent hydrokinetic ever conceived, and one of my favorite legendaries all around. I'm the Ekron Rider, and while it's been established way after Final Fantasy II, and unlike the weak hapless Zora, Kyogre Cannon matters the most.